And as we find ourselves uh, in Luke chapter 20, we continue to note our Lord's Passion Week. And <clears throat> again, this is the Monday, Tuesday of that time period uh, where he is preaching and teaching inside the temple in Jerusalem. And there he is having his authority resisted as it's already been rejected. Now they continue to resist uh, him and his authority, especially in regard to his cleansing the temple and then uh, his preaching within it as well. Uh, and uh, as we've understood over the last few sessions is that the Pharisees, the Herodians, the civilian leaders as well, uh, being the Herodians, and now we're seeing the Sadducees coming up to Jesus Christ with their sneaky uh, little entrapment types of questions, trying to uh, poke holes in Jesus' ministry and his teachings so that somehow they could uh, say that he is a false uh, teacher, uh, he is a false messiah, and ultimately that he would be evil and uh, we need to destroy him. So uh, this is the second round of questions that we're noting now in regard to uh, Jesus Christ being uh, led into various entrapment episodes. But as we see, Jesus Christ is wiser than them all because he has the word of God, Bible doctrine, in his soul as he is the word. But ultimately, he responds in a fantastic way that we're going to note tonight after the question that these idiots asked about uh, the resurrection. And they again went back to the scripture found in the book of uh, the law where again the law said that if a uh, husband dies before he has an heir, then the wife is, uh, should be married to the brother of that husband, and therefore that brother needs to act as her husband uh, in replacement for his brother and bring forth an heir for his brother. And uh, that is what the law said, the sundry law, as we noted in the book of Deuteronomy. And in regard to that, these individuals come up with a question that says, well, if it doesn't happen the first time, what about the second? What about the third? What if she had seven husbands because there were seven brothers and they all died without her having an heir? And then she dies too. Whose wife will she be in the eternal state? Well, in essence, as we talked about on Tuesday night, it's not about the wife and whose husband she is in the internal state that God gave that law, but it was about the lineage of the people of Israel where there would be an heir to this individual who passed before he was able to have offspring. So in this case, it's all about the lineage here on planet Earth. Again, we know that will also go into eternity for those who do believe uh, as Israelites. But basically, it was about an earthly lineage. It had nothing to do with a marriage between the wife and the seven brothers that they allege she married in their hypothetical, ridiculous question. So uh, here we now have Jesus' response in verses 34 through verse 40. And there's a lot of information that Jesus Christ gives to us here. And so we're going to delve into that tonight. In, uh, in regard to his answer, and we'll see the doctrinal principles that come forward from it that give us a good glimpse about uh, life in heaven. So let's read the scriptures once again. <clears throat> if we go back to uh, verse 27, and we'll start with the question, and then we'll get into Jesus' response. It says, Now there came to him some of the Sadducees, and remember on Tuesday we talked about the Sadducees, and their lack of belief in biblical principles of a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spiritual beings. They did not believe in an afterlife. And we see that in other scriptures as well. Again, the book of Acts, as I've already shown you, and I'll show you again tonight. It says, Now there came, by, uh, came to him some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. So that's the point uh, in focus right here about resurrection, because they're talking about in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? But it really has nothing to do with her being a wife. And again, why are they asking a question about the resurrection when they do not believe in one? So we see the hypocrisy critical uh, flatterers coming forward trying to deceive Jesus Christ. Now in verse 28 and says, And they questioned him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife, and he is childless, his brother should take the wife and raise up offspring to his brother. You see, that's the important point, raising up the offspring, having a lineage for that individual. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and died childless. And the second and the third took her. And in the same way, all seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died also. 
In the resurrection, therefore, again, which they do not believe in, so why are they asking a question while they're trying to entrap Jesus and show the idiocy, or what they think is the idiocy, of the doctrine of resurrection, which again, it gets turned on their ear, and they're the ones who look like idiots at the end. But in the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. All right, so that's what we noted on uh, Tuesday night, and you can go back and get some of the details about all of that if you haven't already. But now in verse 34, uh, down through verse uh, 38, we're going to see Jesus' response. It says, Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage marriage for neither can they die any more for they are like angels and are sons of god being sons of the resurrection but that the dead are raised even moses showed in that passage about the burning bush where he called the lord the god of abraham and the god of isaac and the god of jacob Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. And then in verse uh, 39, it says, And some of the scribes uh, answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. So it's kind of interesting, again, these uh, uh, self-righteous, legalistic, hypocritical flatterers coming to Jesus, asking him a question about resurrection that they thought would entrap him and make him look foolish in regard to the doctrine of resurrection, having a question of seven brothers coming forward with a, a, a wife then they bring forth no heir, and trying to poke holes in that doctrine and saying God would not have something ridiculous like that happen. But Jesus Christ turns it all around and really talks about the resurrection and takes their argument argument away because their argument was based on the marriage of the wife in the eternal state not in regard to resurrection but Jesus Christ turns it on the ear and says, there is no marriage in the resurrection so why even bother asking me that question but in answering that he also gives us great principles and precepts about resurrection and then also the heavenly state that we will enjoy when we too arrive at heaven after our time here on planet earth. So again, this is Jesus' response. It is also paralleled in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 29, verse 33, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 24 through 27. Now, uh, in uh, the notes and in what I'm going to show you uh, this evening, I'm going to show you how uh, Matthew and uh, Mark diverge a little bit from what Luke is saying here. Even though it's all the same storyline, Luke adds some aspects to it, and then Matthew and Mark add other aspects to it. And so we're going to put it all together to get the complete message that Jesus Christ was giving at this time. But at the same time, we're focusing on Luke. And in Luke, we have to understand the message that was meant for the Gentile believers as Luke was writing to them. So we'll do that as well. So again, you can see the parallels, Matthew 22, Mark chapter 12. All right, so let's break it down in verse 34, where it says, Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. So what Jesus Christ is doing right away is talking about the sons of this age. And what he's talking about is the current generation. And really, when we expand it further, we see the age of human history. And in this case, as we know uh, that there are various dispensations throughout human history that we call ages as well, like the age of the law or the age of the church or the age of grace, which we're currently living in, when Jesus Christ remarks in this way, and as we see in other contexts in Scripture, sometimes the word age just means the entire human race because Jesus is contrasting the history of the human race to another age, which is when the resurrection is going to occur uh, once and for all, for all members of the human race. And again, on Sunday, I think we'll start to get into that a little bit about the various resurrections and what it's all about. But in essence, what he's doing is contrasting the material age that they currently are living in. And remember, the Sadducees did 
did not believe in an afterlife. Angels, spirits, they didn't believe in any of that. And what they believed in was what was right in front of them at any time. And eternity for the Sadducees was the continuation indefinitely of the human race. So they were all about the material, the things that were right in front of them, and only that is real. And so Jesus Christ sets it up by going along their line of thought. He talks about marriage in this age. And that's what we see first and foremost in this passage. And then he talks about they marry and are given in marriage. Then he's going to contrast that against the spiritual life and the age of heaven when we all are living in eternity forever and ever and ever but yet as i've noted matthew and mark do not have this passage uh, in their gospel accounts and instead they quote jesus in a little bit different way and they quote jesus as being much more direct in regard to answering these pharisees and calling out their idiocy right off the bat and how dumb they were, and that they did not understand and recognize the Scriptures, nor who God is. And we see that in these two passages. So let me show you that. And then, uh, again, this is what Matthew and Mark record Jesus saying, which is, again, is true. And Luke records another aspect of what Jesus said, which is also true. And so in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 22, verse 29, it says, But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken and not understanding the Scriptures. Okay? Right away, you're wrong, <laughs> and you don't know your Word of God. You don't know the Bible. And you're supposed to be the holders of the law, the upkeepers of the law, and the ones who are strict at keeping the law within your life. And oh, by the way, everything is based on the law. And as I said on Tuesday night, remember the Sadducees believed that if it, a doctrine wasn't prescribed in the law of Moses, then ultimately, even though the other writers of the Old Testament, the prophets and the poetics of the writings, as it were, the Chronicles and things like that, if it is uh, uh, expounded in those passages, it does not hold water, as it were. It is not a sound doctrine because it wasn't first given in the law. So again, if it wasn't established in the law, we don't believe it. And so they didn't see where resurrection was established in the law of Moses. But I'm going to show you tonight, and Jesus also points out, uh, how it is established in the law of Moses, which again, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So again, you are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures. Again, it's right in front of you, but you have no discernment, you have no knowledge, you have no understanding, okay? And again, that's the word oida there, which means you don't have a full or complete knowledge of this information. And it says, nor the power of God. And this was another fault of the Sadducees, is that, again, because they don't believe in resurrection, therefore God must not be powerful enough to raise the dead must not be able to do it, even though we have examples of, uh, <clears throat> of um, uh, da, 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 who's the prophet, it just went, came, Ishmael, no, not Ishmael, no, no, uh, no Elijah, no, the guy after Elijah, Elisha, that's it, Elisha, okay, thank you, came and went, all right, but Elisha, even though Elisha raised an individual from the dead, and then we see in the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ raising people from the dead, and he actually did it, and again, in the presence of, and witness of these individuals, and then we see also uh, uh, Paul and Peter doing the like, so in any case, uh, these individuals apparently didn't think that God was strong enough to raise the dead. He's strong enough to create, apparently. He's uh, strong enough to give life. But once you're dead, I guess he's not strong enough. He's not able to, doesn't have the power to raise people from the dead. So again, Jesus Christ rails against them and rebukes them for not knowing this scripture and not recognizing the omnipotence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Then in Mark chapter 12, 24, very similar, but a little bit different. It says, in this, excuse me, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken? So again, isn't this the reason you're mistaken? You're talking about resurrection, you don't believe in it, but yet you're saying that there is a resurrection in this example. Again, you don't understand Scripture. Again, oida is the Greek word. They don't have comprehension. They don't have full knowledge. It's not resonant within their soul. And again, they don't recognize the power of God, certainly God the Father, to raise someone from the dead.
So they show, uh, again, in those two gospel accounts, more of the direct attack against the Sadducees for their lack of understanding, their lack of uh, faith in the power of God, that God would be able to raise people from the dead. And so therefore, Jesus Christ is rebuking them for their lack of faith because of their lack of of knowledge. And again, this, uh, you, know, you can pay me for this later, but uh, again, if you want to have more faith, get more knowledge in the Word of God. The two go hand in hand. It's not in your notes, but I'm giving it to you now, all right? But in any case, if you want to have more faith, again, get more of the Word of God resident within your soul, because with the knowledge of the Word of God, it will build your faith. If you want to have more uh, 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 knowledge of the Word of God, also increase your faith by learning the Word of God and trusting in God and applying that Word in your life each and every day. So hopefully you understand the secular nature of knowledge and faith and how the two work hand in hand. And the more knowledge you have, the more faith you have. The more faith you have, the more knowledge you're going to gain of God and His great plan and also His great power. And with that, you will come to know there is a resurrection because God is all-powerful to do these things. And He can do whatever He wants. And oh, by the way, His Word has promised it to us, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Again, that's going to be uh, what we're going to be noting a little bit later on, uh, again, in the next couple of sessions, in regard to resurrection. But there are a few things I want to point out uh, leading up to that tonight. So he says, the sons of this age. Now, this is an interesting phrase. It's only used a couple of times. And Luke actually applied it to Jesus' teachings back in chapter 16 in verse 8. And there it speaks to the current ge uh, generation, and it points to where the Sadducees are living in the material world. And you see, that's what Jesus Christ does. He goes, the sons of this age, okay? These are members of the human race at the particular generation that you are currently living in. This is in line with their worldview of beliefs. This is their religious view as well, that they believe that only what is real is what is currently material all around us. And then once those things die, they no longer uh, exist or they cease to exist. And there is nothing in the eternal state other than a living human race, okay? But in the eternal state, again, for those who have passed away, they cease existing and they don't live on for all of eternity. So Jesus Christ takes it down to their level, as it were, and he talks about the sons of this age. And so as we uh, think about that, this gives us a great principle about how we should be witnessing and evangelizing our fellow members of the human race. Again, many times we want people to come to our level. We want them to come up to our understanding and our knowledge, and why don't you understand this, and why don't you understand that? And some people get very angry at people because they aren't comprehending what you know about the Word of God. Well, the fact of the matter is they don't have capacity to know those things because they don't have the spiritual life as of yet. And even if they're a believer, if they're in reversionism or apostasy, they don't have knowledge to have faith. They don't have faith to have knowledge. So they're not going to be able to comprehend these things. So you can't talk about those things at the level that you think you have in your soul of knowledge and understanding. So what do you do? You get down to their level. And again, that doesn't, that's not talking about, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, I'm not talking about uh, false humility or anything like that. But basically, you try to understand where those people are coming from. Where are they coming from? What's their worldview? What do they think about the world? What do they think about politics? What do they think about business? What do they think about life? What do they think about raising their children? What do they think about uh, going to work every day? What is their world view? And then utilize examples coming at it from their viewpoint. And then give some information to help elevate that a little bit higher. A little bit higher. 
so that they can understand a little bit more about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So again, this is a great principle where he started at their level. Now, in this case, again, these are the self-righteous, legalistic, arrogant, religious crowd. And of all the people that Jesus interfaced with, these are the people that he railed against the most. He never railed against the politicians. He never railed against Pontius Pilate. He never railed against the Roman government, did he? No. He didn't care much about those things as because they're not that important. Because they're not eternal, and they don't give eternal life. And they weren't the ones that were the stalwarts or stalwarts of bringing people to faith in Jesus. It was the religious crowd. And so therefore, he could be very harsh with them, as he should be. Again, he tried, first and foremost, in a very favorable manner. and tried to show them through his miracles, his signs, his wonders, through his works, through his words. But yet, as they kept resisting and getting harder and harder in their heart, in their rejection towards him, now they're trying to attack him verbally to try to destroy him. And he knows very soon they're about to lay their hands on him to destroy him by crucifying him. Jesus Christ knows he should be refuting and rebuking these individuals very, very harshly at this time. And so that's another aspect of our witnessing as well, because you have to discern what crowd are you talking to. And if there are individuals that know the Word of God, but yet are rejecting it and refuting it, those people who, uh, who are totally twisting things, who have some information, but again, totally wrong about applying that, those you can go after very hard, and, and you should, and very directly. And ref refute and rebuke them as you should with the Word of God. Now, you're not trying to make fun of them. You're not trying to humiliate them or any of that stuff. But you go after them with the Word of God. Do you not have the understanding of who God is and His power? Do you not have the understanding of uh, you know, what the resurrection is all about? Don't you know what Scripture says? Hey, let me show you what the Scripture says. Here it is in black and white. And again... Give that information. And some people you can do that for, but other people you have to be even more sensitive with kit gloves as to how you're dealing with those individuals. And remember, your witnessing should never be a one-size-fits-all. It should always be based on the audience in which you're addressing. And some people you have to be very gentle with and bring them along and nurture them and give them some good information that is uh, basic and uh, 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 of understanding. And then other people who should know more and have some a little bit more knowledge but reject, 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 those people you can go right after hard with the Word of God and truly show them Scripture after Scripture after Scripture why they are wrong in their viewpoint or their understanding or their rejection about who and what God is. So again, a uh, little lesson on uh, evangelism that Jesus Christ gives to us in this little passage right here. Again, how we should be handling people. And as Luke demonstrates to us, again, Luke is writing to the Gentile peoples. He's not writing to the Jewish religious crowd, so he doesn't have to go after the rebuking and how Jesus Christ scolded them. You don't know your scripture. You don't know the power of God. It didn't really matter to these Gentile individuals. What mattered was their worldview that they were thinking in terms of materialism is all that there is. Just like the Gentiles would sometimes think that if they did not believe in an afterlife. And so Luke comes after it from that direction and gives that information to his Gentile audience as he should. And so again, we see Jesus Christ saying, the sons of this age. And again, uh, used, uh, utilized in regard to uh, the human race, uh, where people are currently living and the generation that they cu are currently uh, uh, entering uh, or uh, interacting with, as it were. <clears throat> So when Jesus Christ pointed uh, uh, all of this out, he is also pointing to the union of one man and one woman in the holy uh, and sacred divine establishment principle called marriage as established by God in the Word of God. Oh, and, oh by the way, in the book of Moses, okay? In chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 24. So here he points out to the individual what marriage is all about. And again, in this age, in this life, 
God has given us a divine institution called marriage. It is a marriage between one man and one woman, according to God and his plan. And again, who is the absolute righteous, just, and sovereign God? Okay? So, again, it refutes man with man marriages, woman with woman marriages, or anything else in between. Why don't I just marry my dog or my goldfish, whatever the case may be. Why not, okay, in our day and age, uh, how ridiculous that is. But in any case, uh, Jesus points out to the marriage uh, sacredness that God had created for human history. And that's what's in view here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Again, you know, for this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is God's plan for the human race. So Jesus Christ brings that back into view for these Sadducees so that he can come at them from two perspectives, their worldview and also the book of Moses. Because in the book of Moses, it distinguishes what marriage is all about. So he talks to them from their level. And that's what Luke is pointing out. Jesus also used the phrase in uh, uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 27, very interestingly enough. This phrase is also used that, you know, again, uh, the sons of this age are marrying and giving in marriage. Remember, he used that when we talked about the generation of Noah. And remember the generation of Noah is when the fallen angels cohabitated with women, and then they had the offspring called the Nephilim, okay? And how there was great apostasy uh, throughout the world at that time, so much so that only Noah and his family were the remaining believers, and therefore God brought the flood to wipe out all the rest of the creation at that time, both human and mixed angelic human creatures, the Nephilim who were on earth earth at that time. So when Jesus uses this phrase, we're marrying and giving in marriage, just as he did in regard to the days of Noah, and pointing out the apostasy that they were in, that they were just living life unto themselves, really no uh, concept of God and really no uh, uh, fear of God in their life whatsoever, and just do whatever you want to do at that point in time, and the bastardization of the divine establishment of marriage that was going on there, the Sadducees should have known their scriptures even in regard to what Jesus said in Luke 17, 27, that related back to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, as we've noted uh, just a few months ago. That this is talking about the material world. And what's interesting about that as well is that we also see a little bit of reference right off the bat in regard to what? The angelic race. Because marrying and given in marriage has to do, going back to the days of Noah, when the fallen angels were cohabitating with women. So again, what does the law have to say about marriage? Well, again, the fallen angels were bastardizing God's divine institution. So first and foremost, we understand what marriage is all about in Genesis 2. But then when we look at Genesis chapter 6, now what do we see? And this is going to come out a little bit later on, and we'll talk about this more on Sunday, I believe, but when he talks about the sons of God. Because during the days of Noah, the sons of God were the ones who cohabitated with with the women of men, and the sons of God were who? Angels. So Jesus Christ is slipping in a little bit here right away, just talking about marriage. Oh, remember that time of Noah? And the types of marriages that were going on there. Oh, weren't angels involved? Oh, that you don't believe in? Okay. So Jesus Christ is subtly building, uh, you know, this little message here to the Sadducees who did not believe in resurrection and did not believe in angels. And again, just by using this phrase, marrying and giving in marriage, similar to what he did when he preached on the days of Noah. Now in verse 35, It says, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So again, at the end, we see the marry or given in marriage, but there it's negated. You've got the negatives in the Greek, you know, throughout that says, no, this is not happening in the eternal state. 
And so we're going to get to that point, okay, and recognize that, uh, that there is no marriage in the eternal state. And I'm going to show you why. And again, we'll get into this a little bit more on Sunday, I believe, too, because there's a lot of information to talk about tonight. But in any case, we recognize that in heaven, the husband and wife that was here on earth, that does not carry over into the eternal state. And the main reason for that is very simple, is because we're all going to be married to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And when we get to heaven, Revelation chapter 19, the great marriage supper and ceremony occurs. And then as a result, we then will be his wife for all of eternity, married to Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. And that is the marriage and the only marriage that will count in the eternal state. So the marriages that we had on the earthly state cease to exist that's why when we uh, have wedding ceremonies, we say, until death do you part, because that marriage continues until one or the other or both spouses pass, because in the eternal state, that marriage bond is now nullified, because there's a new marriage for us, and that is to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you can't continue to be friends in the eternal state and have close personal relationship and know all these people. But, you know, if I know most of the wives around here, they're going to be running to the high hills, getting away from that husband as soon as they possibly can. I can't stand being near that guy anymore. Let me get out of here, okay? And the husband's going to be like, why don't you like me anymore, okay? No, I'm just kidding, okay? But in any case, uh, you know, none of that's going to matter in the eternal state because we are going to be so occupied and focused on the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is going to be our husband that we are going to be focused on uh, to serve for the rest of eternity. And we're going to be happy and do it with joy and a, a plenty of exhilaration and excitement. All right, so uh, that's going to be coming up. We'll talk more about that. Uh, in the future, the near future. But before we get there, it says, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead. That's what I want to focus on this evening because considered worthy to attain. What does all that mean? Well, basically... What we recognize and understand is that as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are deemed worthy to have a resurrection and live with God for all of eternity. We are considered worthy in the eyes of God to be part of that age. And so again, here's the contrast. Jesus said, in this age where people are marrying, called the human race, well, in the next age, called heaven and the eternal kingdom of God, that's when something is going to be different. And people who are worthy to attain to that are the one, ones who won't get married and uh, neither marry or are given in marriage because, again, they're going to be betrothed and married to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in any case, what I wanted to focus on is, uh, again, the, uh, the aspect of worthy to attain. Again, the current age versus eternity is what is in view here. They are contrasted. Jesus Christ, again, is talking from their level of the material, but then also bringing in the immaterial or the spiritual of the afterlife that the Sadducees don't believe, but yet they brought it up. You see, Jesus Christ wasn't forcing a doctrine down their throat. They're the ones who brought up resurrection. They're the ones who brought it up. Oh, you want to talk resurrection? Let me tell you about resurrection, okay? And again, another aspect of witnessing. Oh, you want to bring that subject up? Let me tell you about that subject. Oh, you want to bring this issue up? Let me tell you about that issue from the Word of God. And so again, that's how we witness and evangelize. We come at it from the people's perspective. What are they thinking about? What are they most interested about? And what are they presenting to you as a point of discussion? Go from that and again, launch it into the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in any case, he's contrasting the two from their perspective, the current material world, versus the eternal heavenly state uh, that it will happen after our death here on planet Earth. So when it says in the resurrection from the dead, once again we have anastasis and then nekros. Again, Jesus Christ being specific and poignant. I'm just giving you the Greek. Then we're going to come back to principles. But anastasis is that word for resurrection, talking about the resurrection of uh, the dead bodies, as we know. Here it's specifically 
of the dead because we have the word necros here. It's not just in the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead or from the dead as it were. So in other words, once people die, there's going to be a resurrection. You brought it up, not me. Okay, You brought it up, not me. And you want to talk about resurrection. You brought up the object lesson. There is a resurrection according to you because you've asked the question. In the resurrection, who's she married to? Well, remember, that resurrection that you're talking about is one from the dead. You have to die first in order to be resurrected. And oh, by the way, I know you guys don't believe that, but you brought it up. And let me just bring out the point that it is a resurrection from the dead. It's not some other kind of resurrection from something else. It's not a resurrection from being bad to being a good person. Okay? It's not a resurrection from being asleep to being awake. Okay? It's from being alive to being dead and then becoming alive once again. So you brought it up, and here it is. And he points out once again that resurrection is of those who are dead. And that goes back to what Matthew and Mark were saying. God's got the power to do it. God's got all the power. And he's got the power to, if he has the power to create even one atom uh, or one cell in our body, okay, he's got the power to raise something that is dead and bring it back to life. Because he took us and made us alive from dead materials. Remember, he made Adam from the dust of the ground, which had no life and was dead. And he gave it life and he gave it a soul and he gave it a spirit. God is able to, and he is all-powerful, and he can do. So again, we should never doubt what Jesus Christ is able to do. Now, <clears throat> when you look at the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, uh, they kind of uh, 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 parallel this in some respect, but let me just read it to you. It says, in Matthew twenty-two thirty, it says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, Okay, which is the last part, of what we have here in verse 35. But then they also add what we're going to see in verse 36, which we're not going to get to tonight, but it says, but are like angels in heaven. So in Matthew and Mark, those two verses that we see in Luke are combined into one. But Luke has given us some more information because what he's given us is this uh, worthy, again, the worthiness for the attainment to that age, to live in heaven and to be resurrected. So Jesus Christ is saying that there is life after death, and that does refute the false doctrine that these Sadducees had, which again we talked about on uh, Tuesday night a little bit, but that is the doctrine of annihilationalism, which is not a biblical doctrine. Okay? This is a false man-made doctrine and just really a false belief when people think that there is no afterlife. And they think uh, there's no afterlife for anybody, not even breaking it up between believer and unbeliever. But we know that there is an afterlife for everyone, the believer to eternal glory, for the unbeliever into eternal condemnation, which that is called the second death. But, oh, by the way, as people are thrown into the lake of fire, it's an eternal lake of fire. It will never end. They never will cease to exist. That's what annihilationalism says, that you cease to exist, and there's nothing. The soul is gone, the spirit's gone, the body's gone. There's nothing. That's a false doctrine. And it's a false doctrine that typically the secular world in our day and age believes. But, you know, there are some religious that also, you know, teach and preach that, that there's nothing after this life. And it's all about this life and this life alone. And as I said to you before and on Tuesday, if we had that type of mentality, just think how much worse society would be if they thought, oh, no consequences for the afterlife. And I'm just going to do whatever I want to do while I'm here on planet Earth because there's really no consequences to it whatsoever. So the doctrine of annihilationism is a false doctrine. If you have a religion that has a doctrine of annihilationism, what you then have to do is be very strict in regard regard to your laws because they have to control the population somehow in some way because again there's no inner integrity to restrain people from their sin nature if you have that type of doctrine so what they do then is get hyper religious about the aspect of the law of Moses as they did and had their system of do's and don'ts, and you have to be perfect, you have to do this, you have to do that, or there will be consequences for you uh, severely here on planet Earth. And oh, by the way, it could also lead up to your death, and if that happens, then you've got nothing left. 
And so you don't want to die early because you're a bad person, so you better live a good life. And you'll have a longer life. All right? But again, misapplication, false doctrine. They used it in their religious uh, mentality. But today, in our day and age, it's more of a secular type of mentality because Satan doesn't want you to think about the eternal state. Satan doesn't want you to know that either you're going to be in heaven or hell for all of eternity, just as he's going to be in hell for all of eternity. Satan doesn't want you to know that, so again, he pushes forward these types of doctrines like annihilationism because no consequences. I'll just be gone, and that's about it, so I'll just do whatever I want to do now, and it really doesn't matter. So in regard to all of this, Jesus tells us two interesting things about the attainment to this next age called heaven and to be resurrected tells us two interesting things that we wanted to understand and recognize about the resurrection life first in regard to the resurrection life we have to be considered worthy and this too is where we have to be very careful to not get legalistic in our viewpoint and in our doctrine and we have to compare scripture with scripture because if i were to tell you you better be worthy to go to heaven you're going to say, oh, I must have to be a good person. I have to do good deeds. I have to do this. I have to do that. And then you develop a system of human good works so that you can be worthy in the eyes of God. Well, as the Word of God tells us, and I've, I've shown you many, many times, is that we can't be good enough to overcome the one sin that we've ever had within our life. We can't be good enough. So therefore, to be considered worthy has nothing to do with us whatsoever. And it's totally based on the grace of God and then us receiving the position of being considered worthy in the eyes of God. So here we have a, a unique word uh, in the uh, New Testament that Luke pulls out, which is kataxiou, and uh, axios is the root word here that the other gospel writers use, and you see it a couple other times within the scriptures, but uh, Paul puts the prefix on it to make it a unique word. And uh, here it means to be considered worthy, to be judged worthy, and to be deserving of something. Okay? And so that's what we have. Now, we have to really break this word down in, in regard to the Greek, because in the aorist tense, it means it views the entirety of the action. What's the overall view that we're looking at to be considered worthy? And so that's what I, uh, the first thing that we have to think about. What's the overall view? Well, we know we can't do good enough to be worthy in God's eyes. There's none righteous, no, not one. So we can't be good enough to be worthy. So if we can't be good enough to be worthy, then how do we become worthy or how are we considered worthy by God? Well, as you know, through the grace plan of God the Father, by sending His Son to the cross to pay for our sins so that if we believe upon Him, we are forgiven of our sins, made holy and righteous, and therefore are worthy now to stand in the presence of God in the eternal state. So when we look at this, again, the aorist tense is all about that. Again, it's only based on the all-sufficient, completed work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And it means that we've attained that position being in union with Christ because He did all the work. He paid the penalty for our sins when he had no sin of his own. And as a result of our faith in Jesus, which too is a non-meritorious act, we receive the forgiveness of our sins. We are made holy. We are made righteous. We are justified. And therefore, we are worthy in God's eyes to attain to the next age. In other words, we can go into heaven. And we can go uh, in, and be resurrected one day, which we will be. But it's not based on us. It's based on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and everything he has accomplished on our behalf. And this results also in us being justified in the eyes of God because we have the forgiveness of our sins. So to be considered worthy, don't go running out and try to, you know, carry every little old lady across the street and, uh, you know, give uh, money to the brownies every year, okay, whatever the case may be, all right, and do all your little good, do good at works, okay, to be considered worthy, believe on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You will be forgiven of your sins, pardoned of your sins, and you will be made holy and righteous and just. There are 40 things that you receive at the moment of your salvation. 
And all of them are grace gifts from God that you neither earned nor deserved, but God has given it to you. In other words, we also see this, this word that is given to us in the passive voice. And again, that's what I love about the Greek language and how you need to dissect it to understand the truth of doctrine. Because if I was just to read this to you in Eng English and say, oh, uh, to attain to the next uh, age and to resurrection, you need to be considered worthy. What would you do? You'd get right out there on a system of do good works. But when you look at the passage, the air is tense. You've got to view the entirety of the process, and you've got to recognize I'm a sinner, and I can't overcome my sin, but Jesus did it for me, and through him I am made holy and righteous. That's the entirety of the view of the action. And oh, by the way, it's in the passive voice. It's not in the active voice. You see, if it was in the active voice, I would have to do something to be considered worthy. The passive voice, I receive the action of the verb. You see, I receive God's consideration of me being worthy. So I don't do it, but I receive it. And so, therefore, we see that it's based on the non-meritorious act of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where we receive the action of the verb of being considered worthy by God. And if it wasn't for His grace plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, that would never happen. And you could be the best person you want to be in the entire world. You would not be considered worthy by God. As he says, none righteous, no not one. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how can we do anything to be considered worthy? We can't. The only thing we uh, are uh, uh, able to do is have non-meritorious faith. With all the credit goes to him, and the grace is received uh, uh, on our part as a result of that faith. So considered worthy is not something we can deserve, we cannot work uh, for ourselves, and we can't gain this on ourselves in this realm. Because it's all based on the will and plan of God. And it's based on the great sovereignty of God, too. To look at those that have believed in His Son, Jesus Christ, and give them grace, where they are washed clean, made holy and righteous, and now they're worthy to go on to the next age. You see, the unbeliever who hasn't received the forgiveness of their sin are going to take sin into the next age. And that sin primarily is the sin of unbelief, the only sin that can't be paid for. And they're going to take that into the next age. And because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ, that one sin of not believing in Jesus Christ, their name is blotted out of the book of life, and they will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. And oh, by the way, just to prove it, God's going to judge every one of them by what? All the good works that they did here on planet Earth, where the books of deeds are going to be open. Again, go back to Revelation 21. Books are open. And God, Jesus is going to go through, oh, well, you know, so-and-so. You did X, Y, Z, and A, B, C, and E, F, G, H, I, all the way to Z, okay? You did all these good works. But there's one thing you lack. You never believed in my work upon the cross. And because of that, your name is blotted out of the book of life. And so none of us can be considered worthy based on our good deeds. We are only considered worthy based on the non-meritorious act of faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It was all sufficient. And God's grace to give us that blessing of making us worthy, making us holy, making us righteous, and allowing us to stand in the presence of God. And then the second aspect of this is that we will attain it and attain the resurrection. We'll attain to the next age. We'll attain the resurrection. Now, this is very interesting because this is in the aorist tense, the active voice, and it's also in the infinitive. And the infinitive is an infinitive of result. And basically, that's what this is all about. You see, we receive the action of being considered worthy, and then we attain something as a result. We attain the new life, and we attain the next age. And actively, we're going to participate in the next age and in the resurrection. So again, when we talk about uh, the Greek here, it gives us great principles of what resurrection is all about and how we receive it.
And it's not based on works, lest any man should boast, but based on the all-sufficient work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Greek word for attain here is uh, tunkano, and that does mean to uh, happen to be, to meet, to find, or hit the mark, or to obtain something. And this last application is what it's all about, that we do obtain salvation, and we attain our eternal life. This word is also used in a similar way in Hebrews 11.35. Let's just read that. Let's turn there in Hebrews 11, and then we'll uh, finish up for this evening. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35. And uh, if you remember, Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call the... Uh, Heroes of faith and old te- heroes of the Old Testament saint and uh, saints who were faithful. And then in verse 35, but in verse 1 it says, Now faith is, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. You see, they gained approval. They were made worthy in the eyes of God. And by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Oh, that goes right against the Sadducees' viewpoint, doesn't it? And then it goes on, by faith Abel, by faith Cain, etc., etc., or, or black of faith Cain. And then we see the other heroes. Now jump down to verse 35. And, well, let's go to 32, because it says, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, of uh, Barak, of Samson, Jepheth, of David, of S- and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Huh, it goes against the Pharisees. Let's talk about Old Testament. This did happen. And others were tortured, not accepting their release in order that they might, what? Obtain a better resurrection. Now, a better resurrection doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have, uh, you know, a higher level of resurrection than you and I, okay? There's only one resurrection, okay? We're all raised from the dead. The better resurrection is the difference between believer and unbeliever. You see, the first resurrection is all believers, even though there's an order of those. We'll talk about that upcoming. But the first resurrection is of believers. The second resurrection is of unbelievers who will stand before the great white throne judgment seat and be cast into the lake of fire. The better resurrection in view here is their operation by faith so that they would be part of the first resurrection resurrection which is the resurrection to eternal glory and they would what obtain it that too is something that would be received on their behalf why because of their faith and so as we understand jesus christ teaching the sadducees here he's teaching all of us in regard to how do we obtain this new age how do we get to that age how do we get to the resurrection oh you do it by what by faith by believing in Jesus Christ, and those who are considered worthy to obtain it, they have to receive the action rather than uh, perform the action of being worthy. And that action is received by the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ upon the cross in a non-meritorious act of faith. So in regard to the teaching of resurrection, we see how it is accomplished, not by works, lest any man should boast. And in regard to these Sadducees who were sticklers of the law to control the people because they believed in annihilationism, so you've got to control them somehow, keep the law. Jesus Christ is also refuting that knowledge and understanding by saying it's not by works of the law, lest any man should boast, but by faith. Because you have to be considered worthy in the passive voice, in the aris tense, and then also in the infinitive mood where you have the results coming down on you.
So, again, uh, Jesus Christ is teaching very interestingly. And, uh, you know, we read it in the English, and you might just kind of buzz over those things. And you may think that these nuances are getting lost, okay, when you read it over yourself. But, and, or maybe these nuances aren't there. But remember the audience he's talking to. These were the experts of the law with their religion and how sticklers they were of it. And so he was very precise in what he was saying and teaching. And he used these words and phrases, the analogy of marriage, the obtaining to worthiness, all to disprove their false doctrines and to show the truth of God's word. That there is a resurrection, there is I an afterlife, and as we're going to see, there are angels and there are spirit beings. And so when we come back on Sunday, we'll get uh, further into this, and we'll see Jesus Christ refuting all of their unbeliefs, as we know, from the word of God. All right, so uh, let's uh, uh, leave there this evening. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And we ask that you bless us on our travels home and continue to bring healing and recovery to the people of our uh, local assembly and also continue to uh, meet the needs of our church as we uh, uh, are really uh, sore in financial uh, difficulty right now. And we just ask, Father, that you mightily work so that we can have the resources necessary to continue to go forward as a congregation unto you. So, Father, we thank you for this time in Christ's precious name. Amen.